Let's now try to summarize the previous five presentations, which combined took over two hours, so it won't be easy to do that shortly, but let's give it a try anyway. So what is the goal of Perfusion CT in the end? We can use it as a diagnostic tool, and it will increase our diagnostic confidence in a diagnosing an acute ischemic stroke. We won't see all of them. Small lacunar infarctions or small cortical infarctions can be missed on Perfusion CT. A Perfusion CT will also increase your confidence in diagnosing posterior circulation strokes, despite the fact that Perfusion CT is not as extensively researched and validated for posterior circulation stroke. I haven't really talked about it also in my presentations, but you can also use it for posterior circulation strokes. It's not wrong. There's just a little out there on, for instance, defining core and penumbra, but when it's just about diagnosis, it can be really helpful. So we can use it as a diagnostic tool, but it's also and mainly used as a treatment selection tool, namely as a tool to select which patients with an acute ischemic stroke are candidates for either intravenous thrombolysis or endovascular thrombectomy. And how is that role defined exactly? Well, it depends on the time window within which patients present themselves at the hospital. If a patient presents within six hours after last seen well, or after symptom onset, well, perfusion CT doesn't really play a role. As the evidence is now, non-contrast enhanced CT and CT angiography are basically sufficient to provide us with the information we need to make a decision concerning the treatment of the patient. And perfusion CT criteria are not used in that process. So they don't really play a role in patient selection in this time window. Nevertheless, it can be considered because as said, you can also see it as a diagnostic tool and it will increase your diagnostic certainty. Furthermore, it will help you not miss a medium vessel occlusion because especially these uh, M2 occlusions can be tricky and are in daily radiological practice, not seldomly missed, unfortunately, especially if you are in a rush, if you have a high workflow, or if you have little experience with stroke. And lastly, perfusion CT can also help in the detection of stroke mimics, uh, for instance, in a patient who has suffered a seizure. The role of perfusion CT is different in patients presenting between 6 and 24 hours. Their CT perfusion is really necessary because it helps us in deciding which patient will receive treatment and which patient won't. There are several important studies out there. We have the EXTEND study, which um, used CT perfusion to select candidates for intravenous thrombolysis in a window between four and a half and nine hours. We have the DFUSE 3 study, which uh, examined uh, patient selection with perfusion CT for endovascular thrombectomy uh, between six and 16 hours. And lastly, we have the DAWN criteria, which examined uh, the results of um, patients selected with perfusion CT after endovascular thrombectomy who presented between six and 24 hours. So in practice, we can use the extent criteria to decide if a late presenting patient up to nine hours uh, as a candidate for intravenous thrombolysis. We can use the diffuse tree criteria to decide if a late presenting patient presenting between six and 16 hours is still a candidate for endovascular thrombectomy. And we can use the DAWN criteria to uh, decide if a patient presenting between 16 and 24 hours would be a potential thrombectomy candidate if he has or she has a large vessel occlusion. Now, in practice, how do we quickly and reliably interpret, interpret our perfusion CT studies? Well, it's easiest if we just start with the Tmax map. So the map showing us the Tmax values higher than six seconds and Tmax higher than six seconds basically defines the tissue at risk, the tissue that will very likely infarct if the patient does not receive uh, some kind of reperfusion. And our Tmax map or Tmax higher than six seconds map can be either completely normal and that's great or it can be abnormal. What should we do with a normal Tmax map? Well, 
not that much. We can be a bit reassured because now an acute large vessel occlusion is very, very unlikely. Nevertheless, we should, of course, examine CT angiography and on contrast enhanced CT of the brain. This is just part of the puzzle. We still want to know what's wrong with the patient. And we should definitely also check our other perfusion source maps because these can sometimes provide a clue to the diagnosis. So the patient will probably not have a large vessel occlusion stroke or a stroke due to a large vessel occlusion, but the patient can have a stroke mimic. For instance, the patient can have uh, seizure-related perfusion abnormalities, like this patient who clearly has a seizure-related hyperperfusion in the right perisylvian region, as is visible on uh, these cerebral blood volume and cerebral blood flow maps. Now, what should we do if T max more than six seconds is abnormal? Now we have identified potentially tissue that will infarct. This is a patient with an arterial occlusion who does not receive reperfusion. Then we should definitely check if we haven't done so already or see the angiography. Um, to see if there is a large vessel occlusion there or not. Considering the small size of this lesion, it probably be, will be a distal occlusion, but it was, this was a nice example out of my own uh, case collection, so I decided to show this one. If a patient doesn't have a large vessel occlusion or even a distal occlusion visible on the CT angiography, then we should definitely check the cervical arteries to rule out an occlusion or a stenosis of the internal carotids. So everything I'm saying basically um, involves the anterior circulation. If it doesn't, I will tell you so. And this is the, um, I believe, the time to drain map of the same patient. Now we see more extensive uh, hollow hemispheric uh, changes in the right cerebral hemisphere. Uh, the time to drain is clearly increased. And this patient has a high grade stenosis of the origin of the right internal carotid artery, as we can see here. Now, imagine the patient does have a large vessel occlusion, like here in this patient, who had an occlusion of the right middle cerebral artery. So the Tmax more than six seconds is clearly abnormal. What should we do now? Now we should check our relative CBF map. So the CBF uh, lower than 30% compared to the contralateral normal hemisphere map to uh, try to identify an ischemic core. And if we have seen uh, ischemic core, we have to determine if it's a large core, a core that is at least 70 cc's, or if it's a small core, a core smaller than 70 cc's. Because if a patient has a large core, reperfusion therapy uh, will very likely not benefit the patient and can cause harm. There's an increased risk of having intracranial hemorrhage. If it's a small core, on the other hand, this is potentially a good candidate. Well, you don't just have to look at the core size on these maps, however. For instance, take this patient. This patient has a large core. Reperfusion therapy may be more risky than beneficial in this patient, but we definitely have to correlate the size of the core with what we see on non-contrast enhanced CT images. And I windowed this image, these images very strongly because it's quite subtle, but if you look carefully, you see that the density and the right cerebral hemisphere and the middle cerebral artery territory has decreased compared to the other side, and the area in which this, is, this decrease in C roughly corresponds to the ischemic core identified on the uh, RCBF map. And well, I'm not going to say that's reassuring, that's basically a bad sign, because now we know that the RCBF map probably speaks the truth, and this is an ischemic core. If you don't see that on your non-enhanced uh, CT images of the brain, you are potentially dealing with what is called a ghost core, a core that is not real. And that is something we mainly see in patients who present very early because they have severe changes in cerebral blood flow due to, uh, due to the acute occlusion. But this does not necessarily correspond 
to irreversibly infarcted tissue. If you already see signs of infarction on non-enhanced contrast CT, it's very unlikely that you're dealing with a ghost core. If you don't see those, however, and a patient has a very large core, you should really consider the possibility of a ghost core, because if you treat it as a real core, you might take away a potentially beneficial treatment from a patient who would have benefited from it. So always correlate with your non-enhanced CT of the brain. And then there's the reverse situation. So once again, we have a patient with an abnormal Tmax, more than six seconds. What should we do? It's a small core. It's smaller than 70 cc's. Is it a candidate for reperfusion? Before we measure the mismatch ratio and so on, uh, let's look at a non-contrast enhanced CT of the brain because that's also useful. Well, first of all, there is no core. So it's a very, very small core. Wait a minute. Well, basically there's no core. So this looks great. There's only penumbra, but is there? Because if you look on the non-enhanced CT of the brain, we clearly see an area of brain tissue that has uh, that is hypodense with absence of the gray-white matter differentiation, and this corresponds to infarcted tissue. What are we looking at here? We are looking at so-called luxury perfusion. That is a phenomenon that is typically seen in strokes that are already somewhat older. So if this is a late presenting patient, this patient will probably be closer to uh, presenting at 24 hours than at six hours. And what we see here is that either this patient has spontaneous reperfusion of the infarcted area and blood flow has increased. And as a consequence, we no longer detect an ischemic core on the CBF map, or maybe very slowly, very slowly collaterals have been recruited and these now supply the area that is unfortunately already infarcted. So this patient basically has a core and the core is basically the size of what we would have considered the penumbra on the Tmax map. So this patient will not benefit from any further reperfusion. This area is already irreversibly lost. So always correlate uh, with your non-enhanced CT of the brain before making calls on size of the tissue at risk or size of the ischemic core. Now, final case to illustrate the various criteria that can be used. This is a 26-year-old male patient who presented with an N NIHSS score of 16 and was last seen well 12 hours ago. And on Tmax more than six seconds, so the tissue at risk, uh, we see um, that it is a large area of 111 cc's. On the RCBF map, we see an ischemic core, which is pretty small, 11 milliliters. And I told you we should always correlate these findings with our non-enhanced CT of the brain. We see that the core corresponds to an area that is hypodense or non-enhanced CT of the brain, but the other cortical areas look completely normal. So we are definitely not dealing with some kind of luxury perfusion. Um, so not likely. Now we can measure based on the Tmax value and the RCBF value, the size of the penumbra, which is 111 and subtract from that 11, 100 milliliters for the penumbra, and a mismatch ratio as a ratio of Tmax more than six seconds divided by the ischemic core, which in this case is 10. And these are excellent values. Let's summarize our criteria. According to the extent criteria, intravenous thrombolysis can be given between four and a half and nine hours after last seen well or symptom onset if the patient has a mismatch ratio more than 1.2 is definitely the case. A core smaller than 100 milliliters is also definitely the case, and a penumbra of at least 10 milliliters, and is also the case, but the patient presents too late. This is at maximum nine hours, and the patient presented at 12 hours. According to the diffuse three criteria, endovascular thrombectomy in case of a large vessel occlusion, which was present here, can be given if there is a mismatch ratio more than 1.8 is the case, a core smaller than 70 is the case, and a penumbra more than 15 milliliters is also the case, and the patient is within this time window. Now, imagine this patient would have presented at 20 hours, then we would have, uh, then we would have had to use the dawn criteria, 
is this patient, according to Dawn, then still eligible for endovascular thrombectomy? Well, yes. Well, this patient, who is younger than eight years, 62, has an NIHSS score of 16 between 10 and 20, and these criteria say that thrombectomy can be given if the core is smaller than 30 cc's, which is the case in this patient. So, this concludes my presentation and the summary of my presentation. So final messages, always correlate your perfusion findings with your non-enhanced CT of the brain to rule out a ghost core if you're dealing with a large ischemic core and to rule out luxury perfusion if you're dealing with a small core. And always also look at your source perfusion maps. Do not just look at these reconstructed maps because automated processing, uh, these programs sometimes make mistakes. So eyeball uh, is not something you should give up on. Always uh, do it, keep doing it um, to make sure that what you see corresponds to what the software programs calculate for you. And also because it helps in the detection of stroke mimics. Then many thanks to some of the people who have helped me making this presentation. Uh, Dr. Tom de Beulen, from uh, the Zoll Hospital in Genk, Belgium, Dr. Jelle de Meestre from uh, UZ uh, Gastweberg Leuven in Belgium, Dr. Laura Wuits from St. Lucas Hospital in Ghent, Belgium, and Professor Dr. Omid Nico Bashman from the University Hospital in Aachen in Germany. And if you have any comments or remarks or questions, you can always send those to neuroradiology.online at gmail.com. Thank you very much for watching.